Terrific. Well, welcome everybody and uh, Happy New Year, of course. And what better antidote for a truly miserable day than to enjoy a conversation with a fascinating colleague in the college. But before I get to introducing Anne Gorsuch, um, I would like to take the time to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I'd also like to acknowledge that you are joining us from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Well, um, I will also say before introducing Anne, if she will forgive me, just to remind everybody, because it's a new year, that we generally talk, or at least Anne is going to be talking mainly, for the next hour, and then we move into questions. So uh, for the last uh, half hour uh, of our time together, and so um, do feel free to type into the chat uh, your questions as we go along. Well, I find um, having the privilege of uh, being your representative in talking to colleagues, uh, it's very interesting to chart where Emerita have come from. So Anne Gorsuch started off at Brown, went to Ann Arbor, and then came to us here at UBC. You, of course, will know her well, particularly as head of history from 2011 to 2014, where she um, did much to uh, renew the policy of the department, for example, around peer review and teaching, uh, and uh, also spousal hiring. And importantly, and we'll see this is going to be a theme, I think, of our conversation together, uh, faculty support. And then she was deputy to the president from 2014 to 2017, and was an important person in liaison between various community uh, and groups within the university, and helped with the strategic plan uh, and with leadership training, another theme that we'll come back to. Her major publications are really interesting in my book and very pertinent, of course, uh, at this present time, Youth in Revolutionary Russia, Enthusiasts, Bohemians and Delinquents. I love that title particularly. Uh, and then uh, Tourism, the Russian in East European Tourist, under capitalism and the socialist 1960s and i'll do one more uh, of her books all this is your world soviet tourism at home and abroad after stalin and her articles are numerous on russian tourism particularly uh, but also the culture of uh, gender and generation in soviet russia uh, and a number of talks and lectures including at one at the USSR Academy of the Sciences and Culture. Um, and uh, I love the title of one of those talks, Moscow Chic. So um, let's launch into it. <laughs> and uh, and um, does tourism broaden the mind or beset ecology and society? I thought I'd start off with that and let you rip. <laughs> So my, well, first of all, thank you for that kind introduction. And it's, uh, it's lovely to be here and to, before we had the screen set up like this, just to also see so many yeah. people that I know. Um, that's lovely, thank you. Um, does tourism, what's the impact of tourism, I suppose? I think it depends on which country, where you're coming from and what time. So I was really curious about Soviet tourism. Um, in the Khrushchev era, so right after Stalin, uh, and the fact that they were allowing people to travel abroad, very few people to Eastern Europe, a few to Western Europe, even within the Soviet Union, which is something that hadn't been encouraged, and what the impact of that might have been on people individually and politically. Um, and there, I think it, it, it's not like it changed the political system, but certainly has a, um, a broadening impact on people um, in some ways. Um, and in other ways, I would say when I interviewed uh, former Soviet citizens who had traveled, I talked to one lovely woman that I had known for a very long time who had been a quite high ranking party member. So she had been an early traveler to Europe, to England. 
um, in the very early 1960s, which was quite unusual. And she, she was not, she claimed to not be impressed. Now, of course, England wasn't doing very well at that point. So in comparison, living in Moscow as a party member, she was doing okay. Um, she said, what was most surprising to her is that the English had pet cemeteries. Um, so that's what she came home with in addition to lots of small things that she had purchased. Um, so a variety. Well, of course, you've written a lot about Cuba. So, I mean, that is a fascinating part of your story. So I'm going to push you to say some more about that. Um, so first of all, you're kind to say I've written a lot about Cuba. I wrote an article about Cuba. Um, it was published in the American Historical Review. So that was uh, important to me. Um, I was very, it was part of the, it was the tail end of being interested in tourism and Soviet tourists going elsewhere. And I started to get interested in other people coming to the Soviet Union and particularly actually students. So that's what led me to it first. I was curious about Cuban students coming to the Soviet Union. And there hadn't been any work really done on people coming from African countries, from South American countries, and in this case in Cuba. It was very hard to find information on that. Uh, archi very little archival information, some memoirs, but very little. So I decided I was gonna find out more about the relationship between Cuba and the Soviet Union in this very early period in the 60s. Everything that had been written really is largely about the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Cuban Missile Crisis is not a huge topic in Soviet historiography, not a, not a particular area of interest. Um, but Cuba is, and Cuba turned out to be very important in the sort of Soviet imagination of itself in the early 60s, particularly, I think, because of Castro, of sort of youth, young people, revolutionary enthusiasm, and Nikita Khrushchev himself was quite interested in revitalizing this. So we're done with Stalin. Stalin is a bad guy, we're simplifying. We're gonna to return to the enthusiasms of the revolution to Lenin. And Cuba is an example of that kind of enthusiasm of youth caring about the revolution. So Castro traveled throughout the Soviet Union for 40 days. Um, there was a kind of outpouring, romantic really, outpouring of uh, desire uh, for friendship and desire of other kinds for Cuba. Um, I also went, I went to Cuba, interviewed people, Cubans there, who uh, most of whom I interviewed had been married to actually Soviet citizens. Um, so I was curious about that relationship or they had studied there. So yeah, it was a fascinating sideline uh, to what well, no, that, I mean, that's, I, I much enjoyed that article, I have to tell you. But I, I know you're interested too in the relationship between the museum and tourism, and I know that you conducted tours too, uh, yeah. and modern colonialism. And uh, I'd love to hear more of what you have to say on, on that strand, if you like, of tourism. Let's see um, how I can think about the best way of talking about that. The best way of getting might, might not be what you expect, Rodri. It's actually to talk about the Baltics, to talk about Estonia. So Estonia after World War II uh, became absorbed into the Soviet Union, it had been part of the Russian Empire, it had a period of independence and then it was absorbed back into the Soviet Union. But it was talked about as the Russian West and movies that were filmed or made in the Soviet Union about the West were often filmed in the streets of Estonia's old town because it looked the most Western of Soviet cities. So it was this kind of exotic place that was also Soviet. And in that way, it kind of became a museum. So I know you're probably talking about museums in buildings, but this mm -hmm. was an old, old town that became kind of like a museum. Um, where Soviet citizens could travel, could have some experience of what it might be to leave the Soviet Union while still staying with the Soviet Union. But for Estonians, of course, this didn't feel so friendly. This felt mm -hmm. like really an expression of Soviet colonialism um, and of power, um, even if expressed in this somewhat soft way, okay, of um, 
lots of anxiety about who got to travel where, what languages were used, how the Estonians got to present themselves. Um, there's a giant sing song festival in Estonia um, that the Soviets, um, Soviet government sort of tried to take over. The Estonians used it and continue to use it as a sort of nationalist Estonian pride. Um, so this was a kind of living museum in a way, uh, which was an example of this tension between local and uh, colonialist Soviet um, oppression, even as they, of course, never spoke about themselves in that way. Have you, have you um, thought more, um, um, well, I shouldn't say more, but have you thought okay. about the, the, the relationship of tourism and colonialism more widely, actually, Anne? I mean, I think, um, you know, we, we can think back if you want to bring in Britain, for example, to the importance of the Grand Tour for privileged people. Um, I'm not sure how much they actually learned, but uh, it was sort of part of that, as you said, I don't know even if we can call it soft power, but it was part of a spread of imposing a, a set of ideas as much as receiving a set of ideas. Oh, absolutely. And actually some of the really, um, earlier, which I don't mean early, I just mean early in the history of thinking about tourism that was done was expressly on this, really mm -hmm. the colonialist gaze, the colonialist power, and the ways in which tourism, um, starting with this sort of grand tour in the 19th century, but continuing throughout the 20th century and the expansion of air travel and train travel um, has this colonialist aspect to it. I wrote about it really only in terms of Estonia, a little bit about the other parts of the Soviet Union and about Cuba. Um, and it was a part of what I was doing, but there is quite a large literature on that specific aspect of tourism. Yes, and we talked about transnationality too, didn't uh -huh. we? Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, I think that was one of the reasons I was interested in tourism. I was interested in the relationship of the Soviet Union to other countries and vice versa. That's one interest I got interested in Cuba, was trying to expand my own lens uh, through looking at people traveling. Um, it came out in teaching as well. I taught a course for a number of years on the history of the international 1960s. Um, so thinking, getting, getting away from thinking about the 60s only or largely in terms of really the United States or North America um, and having students think about uh, the 60s lens in terms of the Soviet Union, Prague, China, Mexico, um, South Africa, all over, all over the place, many more places than I had expertise in but could dip into um, as a way of shifting um, how we ask those questions. I ended up with a edited collection on the Soviet socialist 60s, what the 60s meant in the socialist bloc. Uh, but transnationalism was really key in there. Please say more. Um, I think we have a notion of the 60s um, from our you know, North American perspective or even the British perspective, the European perspective <clears throat> as very much a kind of youth rebellion, right? And uh, um, some positive changes coming out in government, some negative changes, the war, Vietnam War, the uh, civil rights movements, uh, you know, all, all of those, those uh, familiar stories. And in the 60s, the 60s happened elsewhere, but they didn't happen in the same way, even as they were uh, often periods of real importance. So the 60s in the Soviet Union, for example, um, much of what happened was not in opposition to the government. Uh, it was asking for some changes, um, many of which were more cosmetic, uh, which I don't mean to underestimate them, but how people dressed, what they, how they danced, what music they listened to, um, what architecture was like, what cars looked like, if you could have a refrigerator, could you travel a little bit? Um, but this wasn't a period of huge opposition to the state. In fact, uh, in the Soviet context, the 60s are really a kind of sweet spot of socialism uh, compared to what happened later under Brezhnev and later, or what had happened under Stalin. So I was curious about taking this model of the 60s and seeing what happened in other countries. Well, can I lead you astray, Anne? You and can get lead you me astray. <laughs> to talk more um, about 
that very interesting stretch. Can I stretch your sense of Russia? Because it's so much part of what we're discussing mm -hmm. in whatever you want to call it, strategic diplomatic terms, uh, to come sort of most post Glasnost and into the age of Putin a little bit, because I'm sure you have some insights there. I mean, perhaps Putin should be seen more as part of the Tsarist tradition than the Soviet tradition. I don't know, I'm just throwing that mm -hmm. out at you. So I'm gonna start by saying I'm not a political scientist. Uh, I saw Paul Morantz who came <laughs> up and he is a political scientist. Um, and uh, so I'm wary. I sat once on an airplane when Gorbachev, uh, I was on an airplane when Gorbachev was just coming to power and I ended up sitting next to someone who was I think the vice president of the Rockefeller Foundation or something. I was a graduate student and he wanted to know whether I thought Gorbachev was going to survive. And I said, I'm a historian, right? I'm a historian. And he kept saying, but you have to tell me, is Gorbachev gonna survive? 50-50. Um, so uh, with that caveat, um, I think as a historian, we can surely see the ways in which Russian history, Soviet history um, have impacted causes and conditions and also a sense of choice, what choices are available to Putin or to others. Um, that's true for us in Canada, it's true for everyone, right? So historians are deeply interested in that. And I'm wary about making um, generalizations that would say that um, Putin is a new czar, Stalin was a new czar. Um, Russia, Soviet Union, Russia can have a, a larger variety of ways of thinking about themselves than that suggests. So we've had periods of um, enlightenment, of reform, of revolution, in addition to periods of real um, autocratic, whether it be czarist or um, Putinesque, um, uh, you know, of, of rule. So it's a bit more diverse. Do you think we should be more subtle in our study of Russian history to understand how best to address current conditions? Well, I think that we should all be more subtle in most everything, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one of the reasons to go to university, I suppose, is to learn the complexities to avoid those blacks and whites. Um, and I'm sure it's as true in your own field as it is in mine. It's just that mine tends to be in the newspaper. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, I, I, th I think um, that the, the current situation is very interesting, but we do tend, seems to me, uh, even in the diplomatic world, to kind of jump to conclusions awfully quickly about what's going on. And perhaps I shouldn't, I shouldn't lead you down that path too much further. No, I think I'll avoid that path. I will say that there's been some interesting articles written by Nikita, um, by Nina, excuse me, Khrushchev, Khrushchev who is um, Nikita Khrushchev's daughter, I believe. And she has had some quite interesting pieces in the Globe and Mail, where she's talked about the larger framework of NATO and the history of the Soviet Union and why they would be concerned about NATO expansion, um, and also talked about ways of um, trying to make clear to Putin what uh, limits are. And she has a very keen sense of history, I think. Um, not that yeah. I would agree with everything she says, but I think that those perspectives can be helpful. I um, largely myself tried to stay out of that when I would get asked again, because I'm a historian. And yeah. um, so it's not in my area of expertise. Are you still doing any research on, on uh, Russia or, or have you moved on? I know, I know what you're doing now. We're going to talk about it soon. I'm not doing research on Russia. I am still have some, uh, I suppose, a toenail in. Uh, hopefully, I've led some trips for UBC alumni and hope to be doing that again once we're able to travel. The next one being to Georgia and Armenia. Um, so that's been a way to sort of keep uh, keep some of this alive for myself and also my love of teaching. Um, I've not been doing any more research. I really have started, um, as you know, a new career 
Um, well, I'm, I'm not going to yeah. let you go there for one moment. I'm going to. That's fine. Um, I'm just answering. I'm going to hold you for one more thing. I mean, it's interesting you're talking about mm -hmm. what do we do about tourism post COVID? And you must have been thinking about this because of the, the trips to that you might be making to Georgia and so on. Um, yeah, I think I've been uh, more curious in a way. So that trip will happen depending, it's supposed to happen in the fall. You know, we'll see what's happening with COVID more generally, what's happening in Georgia and Armenia, which have both been struggling a lot um, with COVID. Um, but I think I've been more aware of the conversation as many people might be about um, what's happening to places that have been overrun by tourists. Um, and what the opportunity is for rethinking, I don't know if it's possible, um, what it means to be a tourist destination, um, what it might mean to be a tourist. Um, I suppose it's part of the larger invitation from COVID in general to think about our relationships, to be thoughtful um, about who we are, how we're interacting with our world, uh, climate change, tourism, and tourism is just a part of that. Um, I well, don't, it's a, it's I don't know very, exactly how that will happen. But. No, I know. I, I mean, in some ways, um, you could say all empires become museums. And I mean, I think that's sort of mm -hmm. happening as it happened to Greece. It's happening to Britain to some degree. By the way, in, in, in Cornwall, there was a lovely saying, which was basically send the money, but don't come. <laughs> Very bad. Yeah. Well, I Understand, probably, understandable, right? Understandable. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think probably I would. We we. I'd, I'd like to hear more from you, um, and I, I think it's my duty to to lead you to university governance because you've really got some very interesting things to say about that. So I mean, I'll open it with a, a sort of good uh, Latin tag, quo vadis academia. I mean, where exactly we're going? We're sort of a feudal institution, which has now become a sort of center of, center of high-tech research uh, and development. But uh, I still sort of see the president as the king, the, uh, the deans as the, the, well, I suppose you'd say the barons, heads like we were sort of vassals, and then the rest of us who are sort <laughs> of quite well looked after serfs, I suppose you would say. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, think that I um, I would love to hear from everyone else on this about what their views are about where a university should go. And of course, every university is different. Um, I'm thinking about Tolstoy here now, we could go that direction, but we won't. Um, uh, so, so many feelings about it, I suppose. Um, and in a way, so much uh, longing, if that's a funny word to use in this setting and at universities, um, so much awareness of the promise, um, the enthusiasm that I and so many of my colleagues and your colleagues had for the academic endeavor, the importance of it, the importance of teaching, of research. And um, all of that's still true but also the harder sides, um, whether they be the more uh, bureaucratic, which is another way of thinking about what your model was. Um, the size of the university certainly contributes to that. Um, but there's a, um, a quality that I eventually felt to be kind of dehumanizing. Um, and it's, it's not any individual's fault. Um, so it's not a, it's not the fault of somebody. It's sort of this, the systemic structural means maybe of a university of this size, but probably of many universities um, of that kind of story of that sort of structure that you're talking about and not enough conversation uh, at the various levels between people and this way. Um, so that things are pretty, pretty um, hardened. Um, and that, that um, was difficult to be a part of, difficult to watch, difficult to participate in, difficult to experience. Um, yes, well, even, as, even as the university is a beautiful, um, needed, important place. Well, and this was part, I suppose, of you establishing the Risk Advisory Committee. 
Hmm. Yeah, tell me what you're thinking about. Well, I mean, you set up that committee, I think, in terms of uh, trying to help the uh, faculty um, assume a larger role in academic leadership and what kind of training was needed, but also the fact that I think many faculty find what you would, I think, call life work balance probably quite difficult. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was thinking about something else when you used that term. Mm. Yeah, no, I was quite interested um, at various points in my administrative uh, career, I suppose, which I had not expected. It wasn't something that I was looking for. So people head into administration in, in different ways. I ended up head of a department because as you will know, sometimes it just becomes time, right? And um, I hadn't danced on the table enough and made enough trouble in the history department so I was a safe I, I you know there are ways I probably should have tried to get out of that and I didn't do that early enough so I ended up um, being head coming after I saw Peter Ward my colleague was head uh, before I was quite a few years before I was but a wonderful example and um, I ended up in the president's office not through any uh, that that happened kind of accidentally um, as, as far as I was concerned. So I wasn't a person who was looking for an administrative career. And in that way, maybe um, I came or I carried with me, not that others didn't, but a very profound sense of myself still as primarily a faculty member. I went from sort of close to the ground to 30,000 feet quite quickly. Um, but I was still very aware of what it was to be a faculty member. I, I was in that job for only a year. That's as long as Arvind Gupta was in the job. And um, so connecting with faculty, attentive to faculty needs, he, I think, interestingly decided to meet with most departments in the university and I went on those uh, trips. So we heard a lot, as you can imagine, very diverse views from faculty about what um, would enrich and support their experience. And much of that was about communication, um, connection across the university, clarity about procedures and policies. So transparency, and I think also looking for a way in which faculty could communicate, uh, have conversations with administration mm -hmm. so that there wasn't as much divide. The Senate would have been one place for that to happen, and I think that that, that might have happened eventually to try and figure out how to uh, make the Senate into a a legitimate an institution where things were talked about other mostly than curricular change. Not that that's not important, but it could have been so much more. Um, but the, some other possibilities were to figure out how to open up possibilities for regular faculty, the vassals, as you called them, to encounter and to provide uh, information, advice, expertise at various levels of the university. So uh, a kind of internship, although one would never want to use that job because that wasn't what the positions were, but for someone to go into the vice president of students office uh, to uh, contribute their expertise, to learn, to have more opportunities for people at various levels to encounter each other. Um, a very small, it would be a very small contribution, but really came out of um, some of this experience of seeing these giant divides and the ways in which it was hard for people to talk to each other or hear each other. No, that, that's true. I do, I do understand. Um, tell us some more about um, your leadership training initiatives, because I think that's very interesting uh, um, to add on, and we can come back to talking about whether the Senate can have a, a stronger presence in governance in the contemporary university? So I wasn't um, primarily, as I remember it, a director of these leadership initiatives. I myself benefited from uh, the ALDP, the leadership training that was offered to heads. Um, as part of that process, I did additional work in uh, training as a coach. Um, I was quite committed when I went into the presidents, well, even in the deans, really, um, as a head, in trying to figure out ways that um, 
people didn't just go from being a faculty member to being a head. Maybe they were associate head, maybe they were graduate chair. There was very little available, um, unlike other kinds of institutions where people in theory are moving up. Of course, none of us think that moving into administration is moving up. It's like moving into the dark side, right? That was kind of the way that faculty usually see it. But of course, once you're in that position, you need some, uh, you could benefit from some training, some experience, some uh, ways of better understanding how to manage, uh, how to lead in ways that are sensitive and transparent and collegial. And there was almost nothing available before people were already in those jobs. No, so, it's true. I mean, you, you, you were kind of jumped in and hoped for the best to a certain degree, even I would say in, in my time. Mm -hmm. um, it is sad, isn't it, that can I pick up on that whole dark side thing? Because <laughs> it seems to me that the future of the university needs a lot more faculty who are uh, actually involved in even the day-to-day -day governance. Uh, I agree. And actually, I think it's only to the benefit of departments that that um, it can be very hard as a faculty member to under have, you know very little about how the place works. And if you don't know how it works, it's really frustrating. It's frustrating even if you do know how it works, but to understand what your head is talking about, why things work, how come you get new positions, how come you don't, why you have this many people to teach. Um, so more transparency about what the choices are, how the budgets work, uh, where the inflection points are, um, how changes might be made, positive changes in diversity and inclusion. All of this is kind of opaque, um, I think, for most people until they become um, heads. And even then it's pretty opaque. Um, so I think, I, I, and not that everyone would need to do it, but that there would be some opportunities for more movement um, seems to me um, a benefit, possible benefit. No, I was particularly interested in you talking about a model which would have faculty involved earlier in their careers. I mm -hmm. mean, mm -hmm. to some degree, without in any way insulting any of my colleagues. I mean, we tended to be older when we got into that situation. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, any more ideas about that? I mean, including, I suppose, having a better sense that people would be recognized for that work as well as for the teaching and academic and like yeah, enterprise. Absolutely. I think one of the tricks, of course, is that the reward system isn't aimed at any of that. Either the personal reward system, people's own sense of what matters uh, at the university, beyond the university, internationally, none of that work is rewarded. Um, and um, financially or in any other sense. But there are, of course, still people who have curiosity about places where they might have some leadership roles, even in their own fields, right? Setting up centers. Um, so I, I would love to see a system whereby people could essentially apply. I, I mean, I don't know the details, but we, we were trying to figure this out. But essentially apply places that had room for faculty, would make those available. People who are interested in working in those places for a semester or a year for you know, a one course release would be able to go and participate. Um, but there would be a system set up across the university that facilitated people um, having access and for uh, access to learning about various about the university and leadership roles and also for administrative locations to have the benefit of um, having people cycle through them. Well, I, I, I do remember that both Stephen Toop and Arvind Gupta were quite interested in trying to give the Senate more presence. I mean, I have to say from a personal point, I did write to Stephen Toop and say, you know, um, all important things have some kind of symbolic space, but the Senate doesn't. Um, it's the boardroom. There isn't the Senate and boardroom even anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder, I know I'm throwing you in the deep end a bit there, but <laughs> what, what your thoughts about that are? Um, well, I have to say, when I took the position in the president's office, I knew almost nothing about the Senate, which was suggested to me 
almost nothing. I had never been to a Senate meeting. And um, so my experience was not that the Senate doesn't matter, but that it could matter more. That it was very insular. That it was largely about curricular changes or about deans and other administrators making presentations that had already been agreed to. So the folks who were most active were the students, bless them. Okay. And um, otherwise, it was a pretty sleepy place. And um, it doesn't have to be that way. There are universities where there are actual governance mechanisms where faculty and students can have conversations that might be of more import around policies. Here really at UBC, it really is the Board of Governors. And uh, the Board of Governors has its own uh, challenges in being the place that runs the university. That's probably not my place to say, but we did try a couple of joint meetings. I mean, I think that not just me, I hasten to add, but I think the idea was that the Senate would be involved much earlier in decision making because the Senate floor was, I think the best way to describe it was frightfully polite. And mm -hmm. that's really good in many ways. But um, it, it, as you say, it wasn't really a place where you could get to grips with things, partly because the complexity of the problems are, are so extensive, are, are they not? Yeah, so back you to you rising 30, what was it, 30,000 feet? Yeah, I think in some ways you <laughs> couldn't just change the Senate, right? You'd have to create a, a diff other mechanisms. I, I'm not an expert on this, so I'm just riffing now. Um, you'd have to create other mechanisms where there were more possibility for conversation before something just got to the Senate. Mm -hmm. And it would have to be decided what the Senate was really focusing on. Because surely there's way too much out there. UBC is a $2 billion operation. Um, it's, it's a massive institution, really. And so what the Senate was focusing on, what it wasn't, um, so that it... it um, so that there was there was an opportunity for real impact and not just sort of lip service. I, I don't know what that would look like. I just know that, that it struck me as um, too bad, I suppose, a loss that, that there wasn't some place that functioned for real conversation, um, which as you're saying, the Senate really does not. Well, not on the floor. I mean, in fairness, I think the committees did very good work, but they weren't always able to communicate, say, with the board and other people mm -hmm. at a time, and it mattered. But I'm not here to talk. I, it's you. And so I want to get back you back to your sense of this huge change in mm -hmm. spatial perspective, I would say, about the institution. Yeah, um, it was. I... Um... I did. I, I didn't go up like this. So I went from here to there, or maybe from here to there, to 30,000 feet. And um, so it, it, it was a, a profound education, um, sometimes uh, a pleasant one, always an important one in how the university worked, in power, um, in uh, budgeting, in money, um, in provincial relations. Um, and challenging in some ways, actually returning to a department. Um, not that I was very fond of the history department, um, but coming back into the history department, I think that is not uncommon that that happens to people who've had administrative roles. Um, I had a colleague who said to me that he thought that I was still somewhere at 30,000 feet. It was hard, you know, <laughs> I was finding it somewhat hard to engage in, in the conversations in department meetings. Um, uh, they were important. It just wasn't where where my, where I was in quite that way. Mm -hmm. Well, now I think we should move move on if you're because I mean part of what you did for the university I think relates to what you're doing now because of your uh, interest in a holistic understanding of we faculty and if you like the the the, the students the wider body of people who occupy the society of the university you might mm -hmm. say so. Please say some more um, about um, the work that you're doing now. I think um, we talked about what might be the best phrase, therapeutic coaching, I think mm -hmm. you felt was the best description. 
uh, of so, what you're doing. Thank you. And I know it's a very unusual thing, but my, my change um, as an emerita is probably quite different or unusual from uh, what is uh, more typical. I, when I was head of the history department, I was quite interested in learning more for myself and in service to the department about conflict, um, about working with individual faculty and working with groups. I had a lot to learn um, about um, the varieties of things that, that we all bring to any conversation. Um, and as a head, I'm sure your experience was the same. You can feel that people bring to whether department meeting or conversation in your office or a request for service, all kinds of things that have very little to do with exactly what's on the table. So I was curious about getting more training for myself that I would do a better job in facilitating uh, changes in the history department, the health of the department. So I went and got training as something called an integral coach for a year off and on in California. I was supported by the university. And when I was done doing that, I uh, brought some of that work to the history department, but I also worked on behalf of um, this leadership training organization at UBC, which was working with heads and with other administrators at various levels. And I became a coach working with some of those people. I'd be assigned people and I would work with them. And I found that work um, extremely rewarding. And a lot of the issues that would initially be brought up would be administrative. How do I do better with this? Um, but often they ended up coming into more emotional, more personal, more individual issues about satisfaction, job satisfaction, life satisfaction, balance. Um, and we'd have to, I, I would feel that we needed to go that way as well in order to better support somebody in whatever their jobs were. Um, when I went into the president's office, uh, I wasn't doing that explicitly. That was no long, that was not appropriate to carry on you know, all of that work. Um, I went back to the history department and I realized that actually I, I loved that kind of individual work. I also liked group work, I'd done some group work, uh, but mostly individual work. And so uh, long story short, decided to uh, leave and uh, start a new career. I work with a variety of people, many of whom are faculty and some of whom are not, many of whom are not. You find a difference actually between fact, I mean, are, are we a different breed? Are we... <laughs> we are a different breed. We are a different breed for better or for worse. Um, I think it's also that we consider ourselves to be a different breed. Um, and so it's very frequent for a faculty member to say, oh, no one will understand the nature of my work and life. Um, and so they don't have to explain that part. I don't know if that's true. I also work with artists and real estate agents and all kinds of people that I've not had personal experience with and it seems to be okay, but we feel ourselves at the very least to be different. Um, and I'm gonna say a funny thing, which is strangely, faculty are not that curious. So that's an odd thing to say. We're very curious about our research areas, but we're not necessarily hugely curious about ourselves um, until we're invited to do that. And lots of other people are more curious about themselves um, and what's, what's um, driving them, what's troubling them. Uh, what's stuck, what their triggers are. And faculty, maybe we've all been trained as type A people um, to have our noses down, to perform, to um, be sort of public in a certain way. Not sure. Well, I mean, and also, I mean, we, we do stick our necks out. I know it's not as uh, important as many other people, but, you know, once you write something, uh, Mm -hmm. you're, you're open to all sorts of criticism. I mean, I used to feel that perhaps within graduate students that they were too worried about competition mm -hmm. because it seemed to press on them too much. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether you ever also did some, some help integral coaching with, with graduate students and mm -hmm. postdocs as well. Um, I, I did a little bit when I was uh, 
at the university. I haven't done it since. Mm -hmm. um, but absolutely, I would agree with you, Rodri. But I would say that that, has, that continues after people are graduate students, right? Um, there's a, a lot of, um, yeah, we're, we're in a kind of rough and tumble environment in a certain way, but it's all intellectual. Uh, yeah. And that's a, that's a particular place to be. Hmm. Well, now tell us more about the work you're doing now. I mean, um, you've said something about it, but... Uh, yeah. yeah, so I've, um, I've set up a practice, a private practice, um, doing coaching. And I, I described it to as therapeutic coaching because it's not really sometimes coaching um, can be described as someone comes with some help for public speaking, uh, which is perfectly valuable. It's sort of a short-term thing. What I'm doing really is um, uh, more therapeutic, more long-term working with people on uh, emotional, uh, but also physical, intellectual issues, sort of integrating all of those, all of those aspects. Um, I, I, I tried for a bit to see if there were some avenues at UBC to do more conflict resolution, which is something I was quite interested in. Um, UBC, most uni many universities don't do very well with conflict in a department, amongst faculty members, amongst faculty and staff. Um, there's not a whole lot of good resources for that. So that was something I was quite curious about. But I think um, at least when I was there, UBC wasn't quite ready to try and figure out how to do, how to do that, uh, how to do that um, in ways that I could see might still be there. Um, so I, so I've instead uh, ended up doing it, doing this kind of more private practice. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, that's very interesting talking about conflict revolution with, within the university. Mm -hmm. what, what were some of the particular difficulties then that you, you felt might? Well, I key? imagine, Rodri, as head of a department, you would be yeah. able to uh, list those without too much trouble, right? Um, we're an unruly bunch of cats, right? So you get someone misbehaving, <laughs> bullying, bullying someone else, right? Uh, it's really hard to figure out what to do. We can't fire people. We can't, we really don't even have any power over them as heads. Um, maybe we can give them a different kind of teaching assignment, but there's very little to do. It really relies so much on capacity to negotiate, to deal with conflict, to have conversations, to be transparent about what's expected, um, all of which is quite different and I think are learned qualities. Um, so I don't know what your own experience as head would be like in that realm, but I didn't find a lot of places outside the university to look for that kind of assistance. It was very much within myself or being trained elsewhere. Well, you know, I don't know what your feeling is, Anne, but to some degree, the university I was brought up in was one where, the, where, where you, you participated if you wanted to, and if you didn't want to, nobody, it wasn't that they didn't care, but they weren't particularly interested, mm -hmm. right? And I mean, that's, that's been a huge change, hasn't it, at UBC and I think within departments and you can go back to some of the policy changes you um, brought in uh, in the history department. I mean, to some degree, we weren't we really weren't thinking much about the person who's being educated or the person who was educating. It was really about the thing, wasn't it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's true, and I think that's less possible now in many ways um, for a whole lot of reasons. Um, and I am maybe more aware again from being ahead, but also from the 30,000 foot view of the huge number of departments and units which were struggling with conflict and problems and how inhibiting that was to their um, health, to their success, both individual and communal um, and how hard it was for um, the university, for human resources, for anyone to figure out how to address those issues. I didn't have an answer to that. It was just, I could see, see across the university in a way I hadn't been before, um, how debilitating that could be and how much work was spent in a Dean's office 
dealing with difficulties, with challenges, um, and how much time that could take away from other kinds of what the university was supposed to be about. Um, and I don't think, at least when I was there, UBC had a particularly good handle on what to do about that, understandably. It's not unique to UBC. Well, there were some marvelous things. On, uh, I, I don't mean to intrude on, on you talking. I, I do think ahead. some great things happened in terms of the sort of protocols and, and things that you could do to, to deal more with student faculty and student difficult, inter-student difficulties. I don't know that that was true for you too. I, I really welcomed that because there were processes which you could follow, which mm -hmm. took some of the edge off some of the, the, the difficulties. I think that's true. I think that's true. There were mechanisms, more mechanisms for people. I mean, faculty aren't trained to deal with, student, with depression, with anxiety, with all the mental health issues. And so to have mechanisms, uh, better mechanisms for people to express their concern and hope that somebody would be taken care of. I think there are lots of issues around that too, spaces. Uh, enough space for counseling, yeah. all kinds of stuff. But. Well, I mean, talking of that, I mean, these are anxious and quite depressing times. It's sort of mm. a bit like John Bunyan's. I know you, you and I, um, I, th I think, have a interesting perspectives on things. But you know, Pilgrim's Progress, the one thing he was supposed not to trade in was the slough of despond. There seems to be a big slough of despond out there at the moment. So I don't know if you but talk a little bit to that part of your contemporary practice. Um, so maybe going back to UBC, one thing I can say, and I'd be interested to hear in other people's experience too, depending on when people, um, people left, stopped teaching, was I hadn't taught full time for six years when I went back into the classroom. And the difference in um, articulated student mental health issues was dramatic. Mm -hmm. And I imagine there's lots of different reasons for that. One being more comfort in talking about it. I mean, there's lots of reasons, um, but it was notable to me how much more time um, I needed to spend addressing uh, students' mental health issues. And um, that, that, that was just six years. Um, so I think there's lots of reasons for that. Um, some of that was international students coming and they had come from places where they weren't able to talk about that or articulate that to a place where they could, but surely there are many, many other reasons. Um, so getting back a little bit to universities, um, being asked to take care of people as whole people, whether they be faculty or students or staff, um, it's, a different, it's a different world for better or worse. I don't no, I mean, I have my feelings about it. You might have different ones um, and, and what universities are being asked to do in that respect. Are you finding that people um, that you're looking after now, uh, that the level of anxiety has, has increased because of the last two years that we've been through? Absolutely. I would say, uh, uh, absolutely, I would say it's, uh, the level of anxiety, but also the level of possibility. So that many people are, I think, um, have experienced a different way of working. Um, and sometimes that invites them to think about what they'd like to change one way or the other. So it's not all oppression. It's also um, opportunity, possibility, I think. Yeah. Can you give us an example? I mean, that's great to hear. Can you give us an example that, I mean, without going on yeah. anybody's privacy. <clears throat> um, so I think people, some of the people I'm working with thinking about work-life balance. So they might have, when, when the university was shut down for all of the pressure that was there about having to teach online, which obviously people are doing again for maybe just a few weeks, maybe longer, um, they were commuting, they were at home, they had strangely more time with their children, even as it was stressful because of kids not being in school, right? So there was like, yeah. um, so that was, there was a, like a moment that wasn't a sabbatical to think about, oh, how would I like my life to be organized? Um, so it's not anti-university, it's just uh, what, what are the possibilities? How do I think about this? How do I make decisions about this? Um, so there's, there's one example. 
Well, alas, I think, well, no, I shouldn't say alas at all. I think <laughs> now we should turn to uh, the questions mm -hmm. and I'm going to open my, my chat box. And um, I think there are quite a few questions. Let me get to the top. I'm not very adept at this. <laughs> are we able to see people ask the questions or we just see the words, I guess? I think we way. can just see the words. I'm okay. looking this one. Um, there we are. This is from Sneja Ganev. Mm -hmm. Hello there. Um, I understand the distinction you're making between your discipline of history and political science, but history is often politicized. And I wonder what you think about the recent banning of the memorial project in, I'm sorry, I'm just going to get the last. In the Soviet Union? There. Yes, I think so. Yeah. There we are. Um, so you're wondering, yes, absolutely. History is definitely politicized, no doubt. I said what I did only because I can be reluctant to speak to con immediate contemporary events, knowing that the limits of my expertise, um, but absolutely. I um, am more upset to see the banning of Memorial than I have been for quite a few years in terms of what I've seen coming out of Russia. Um, that's a, a vital human rights organization, a historical organization um, that has done tremendous work, but also was one of the one of the really important signs of change under Gorbachev. So to see it shut down um, is pain, I find painful. Thank you. Yeah. This is from Martin Putterman to mm -hmm. everyone. Um, you could talk a bit more about your current pursuits. That's a nice <laughs> open. <laughs> Marty, what do you want to know? <laughs> Can we put Marty on here and he can tell me what he's I looking for? I don't know. Can you, do, can you do that, Sandra? I'm not, not sure. I'm going to give it a try. Just give us a few seconds. It's happening. There's Marty. There you go. What do you Where? want to know more about, Marty? Yeah. So I mean, the, the talk promised talking about what you've been doing post-university <laughs> and your recent work on leadership. So. I thought, I thought we'd hear a bit more about that during the talk. And since it didn't go that direction, I would have liked to hear more about that. Ah. Thanks. And maybe share it with everybody. <laughs> um, so I'm not really working on leadership per se. So I'm not sure what that part would be. I mean, I am working on leadership in that I work with individuals to think about, sometimes to think about how they might um, support, develop um, their own leadership um, roles, um, their capacity for leadership. Um, but my work right now is really working with individuals. So I do that in a couple of different ways. In the last couple of years, it's primarily been via Zoom. Um, so it would look like a therapeutic model to you. Someone comes on, I have some understanding of their history um, and we talk about what they're bringing um, what they would like to work on. Um, I thought, I have to say, that I'd be working with people for, you know, I don't know, a couple months, six months. I've ended up working with people for a couple of years thus far um, on a whole range of different problems. Um, I also have some training and do some work in somatic expression work. So paying attention to the ways in which people's bodies express and hold emotion. Um, and so we do some work with that as well. Um, and uh, I'm interested in the whole person. So I'm interested, I've been a very intellectual person my life being a professor. I'm interested in their minds, but I'm also interested in their hearts, my own heart, in their bodies, in any sense they might have of an expanded field of possibility around them. Uh, we talk, we sometimes do guided meditations, we sometimes work on people's bodies. Um, it's quite different than my academic work, but very informed by my experience at the university. Well, I'm grateful to Martin because I mean, the trouble is it's difficult to get everything out in these kinds of conversations. But um, 
Can I can I pick up a little bit on Martin? I mean, that phrase you use, life satisfaction. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a really interesting phrase. Can you can you talk some more about that, particularly in terms following what Martin has asked and what you're doing now? So when I thought uh, when I um, I'm 61, so I uh, uh, left the university early in terms of becoming an emerita. But what I felt what I was in danger of happening was losing my aliveness. I had loved my job, um, but I never wanted to be the person who didn't want to be there, who was teaching the same courses, who wasn't doing my research. And not that that happens to everyone as they age or at the university, but I could feel the risk for myself. I wanted to continue to feel a kind of aliveness, enthusiasm, learning, being on the edge, a discomfort, I suppose, um, an inner journey. So those were all really important to me. And they have been important to me for my whole life. I've been in training in various ways for doing the work I'm now, doing now as a sideline to everything I was doing. Um, but why have only one life? You know, I didn't have to have just one life. I could have more than one life. What I don't know what I'll be doing in 10 years. Um, so I decided to take a leap and uh, work in a very different way, again, informed by who I've been up to this point. Right, well, we've got two more questions. Um, please describe the boundaries, this is Peter Dodek, uh, between your work and the work of other therapists, such as psychologists, psychiatrists, family therapists? Uh, really good question, of course. I'm not a therapist in that sense. I don't, I've not been trained as a therapist. Um, the reason I use the term therapeutic coaching on this conversation is because coaching per se tends to be, as I suggested, people think it has to do with, um, again, teaching someone about public speaking or some kind of very particular job associated way. And the kind of coaching I learned and I've been supported in learning more about is a more of a whole person kind of approach. Um, and so um, I'm actually mentoring now with a psychiatrist uh, who's taken me on, not again, because I, I, I am a ther I'm not a therapist, but I am interested in those kinds of questions. I am also though very aware of my limits so if someone uh, approaches me who has um, mental health issues uh, that, re that, that would be best served by working with someone who is trained in those ways, absolutely, that's who they should be with. So the people I see tend to be generally healthy uh, in every possible way, but are looking for um, company in exploring who they are. Yes, I'm, that's very interesting. I mean, you had another phrase that fascinated me about being curious about self. Mm -hmm. I'll get to, there is another question from Snager. I'm not ignoring you, Snager. I <laughs> <laughs> um, it's super interesting to be here and answer these questions because this is so not what we talk about uh, in the academy. <clears throat> so I'm very aware that like the questions you started with about my academic interests or perhaps my administrative experience are uh, so much more usual. And to be asked about, um, what did you just say? The uh, curiosity about the self yes. um, in an academic setting is really asking me to bring together uh, different ways uh, that I have been. Um, so I think it goes back to what I said. So it's, that's been, that, that's been true for me forever. So I've, I've long had a curiosity about my own um, and uh, others' emotions, developing development, capacities, inner life, okay? So that, that's just part of who I have been and probably informed in part being a historian because it is a way of asking those questions if about another time and place. Um, so you get to explore those questions about who, who human beings are and for the sake of what, why are we here? What do we, what's our meaning? What are we doing? And that's part of what I love teaching. The Soviet Union is a rich place for asking about behavior, about motivation, about meaning. Um, and students really responded to that. And I love teaching in that way. 
Um, <clears throat> and then, as I said, uh, as a head, uh, and then doing some of my other work, I'm so aware of, we bring our full selves everywhere, even if we pretend we're not. We might pretend that we don't have emotions um, or longings or desires or fears, but we do. Of course. <laughs> well, going, going beyond the in the ego, and again, Snage, I'll, I'll get your question, I promise. I mean, we did talk about sort of deeper understandings, and I don't know whether you might share something of that, because I know that you have a, a, a deep um, faith. And I, I would imagine that that is also fed into your understanding of how you help the self and the, the idea it's mind, body and spirit. Um, again, have you ever asked that question in an academic setting? Um, not necessarily. <laughs> And anyway, we're, we're on the outer edge of the Grove Academy here, so. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's sort of wonderful. Um, what, what, what we're doing, uh, not of interest to everyone, but sort of freeing. Um, so uh, I suppose to cut to the chase, my, my long-term now, so not to talk about religion, but to talk about spirituality, even though those things are not always separate. Um, I am a long-term meditator. So um, I'm a committed meditator, and, um, and that is a place, both my internal own experiences in meditation and also my experiences in uh, uh, meditation trainings and groups uh, are, have all been deeply influential to me. That's my place of quiet and of listening to my own self which is hugely important. Can I read the other questions? But now, finally, Sneja, emotions have become a very important area of research and they're always culturally specific. What informs your own practice in relation to working with emotions? How do you expand beyond your own specific cultural location? Beautiful question. So, uh, beautiful question, thank you. I would say, um, just to back up for a second and think about my own historical roots of this. Um, when I wrote the article about Cuba and did research on Cuba and the Soviet Union, it really is almost a history of emotion and emotions, because I was quite curious about the emotional meaning of Cuba to the Soviet Union in the Soviet context in the early 1960s. So it was informed by a reading of the history of emotions. Um, so that's an interesting question, which makes me see that. It's not what you asked, I understand that, but it makes me see my own trajectory. So thank you for asking. Um, yeah, it comes out of uh, the studies that I've been doing the last few years, which is what you could really call comparative affect studies. Mm -hmm. But affect mm -hmm. is treated very differently in different languages. Absolutely. In different cultures. Absolutely. So I, um, I, agree, which is a funny word to say, but yes, I agree with you. So um, in the training that I had and in my own practice, a lot of the training is really about self-awareness, right? To see ourselves, our triggers, our histories, our ancestors, our everything, um, and, and see the ways in which that impacts who we are, how we might respond to something. And um, what we offer, what invitations we have. And I have only the limits of who I am with an effort to be aware of that and to bring that forward. Um, I, one thing that helps in this, I would say, is that my goal is to be keep people company. I'm not a healer. I'm not changing them. I'm not impacting them in, in those ways. I am in a sense, um, on a teeter-totter with people. So I float something towards them and see if they respond rather than uh, directing them down a slide or uh, if, if, if with a metaphor of playground. Um, so it's really very much uh, keeping them company, being informed by people. But of course there's limits with this in the way that there are in writing history, um, absolutely. It's, it's no different. 
in, in, than in all of the work uh, that we do and our need to be um, humble, <laughs> a lot of humility and self-awareness as best as possible. So do you want to go any further or? Well, it's just that um, it's become such a rich field and, and people are questioning um, the ways that uh, we can translate, you know, this whole idea of getting away from a universalist kind of approach yeah. to emotions and increasingly now with all the work that's being done. Mm -hmm. um, it's very much uh, about how you translate across cultures, how you translate across con concepts, for example. Yes. Freud, Freud did not write in English. And the whole history of uh, translation with Freud is, is fascinating in its own right. That's what I mean. If we yes. don't examine um, very self-reflexively um, how we're using these uh, approaches, um, I think we, we tend to get stuck in a kind of universalist kind of approach to it, which, which uh, may not be the best, especially at the moment. It's yeah. beautiful yeah. and really um, important. And um, I, I would say for myself that mostly it has to do when someone raises an emotion, I ask them what they mean by that, um, which is not too far from what I did as a historian, mm. in a sense, right? Um, so what, the, to, what is their vocabulary? What does that word mean in their understanding? And does your knowledge of Russian um, play a role in this? Uh, no, not yet. I have yet to have a Russian, um, a Russian, not in a specific sense. I don't have any Russian clients. It does in the sense perhaps of some quiet, um, quiet experience with a variety of ways of being. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for the Well, we've question. got a couple more questions um, from Frank Tester, who will be with us happily on Tuesday the 8th of February. Um, I would think that you might have, in relation to human development and individual personalities, stumbled across something called psychohistory. No, that's his question. Uh, have you given thought to how the historical moment or context relates to human behavior, human values, human personality, and so on? So interesting question. Psychohistory, um, I don't know a lot about. Um, it was something that was, uh, and Frank might be able to tell me more, that was practiced in terms of the Soviet Union, largely um, and most famously by uh, actually a political scientist historian who wrote some biographies, Tucker, who wrote some biographies of Stalin. So it's been used quite a lot um, or more in, in terms of personalities of Soviet leaders. Um, that was never my area of expertise or interest. So I would teach about them, but I was really much more interested in daily life. Um, and in that, and more cautious about assuming that I understood, I suppose, the emotions of people in some kind of, just as the last question suggested, universalist way. So uh, trying as best I could to articulate those emotions, what I saw of them, ask questions, be clear about my own position, but not to uh, make assumptions about sort of psychological, the psychological nature of human beings. Mm -hmm. Well, one, a couple more questions. Um, and of course, anybody do come back if you have further things you, you, you wish to add or change your, to your questions. This is from Bod Woodham, Woodham to everyone. To me, the abrupt end to the Arvind Gupta presidency represented a real clash in the model of university governance. Please, to the extent that you're willing and able, answer the question, what happened? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be quiet. <laughs> oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can see me hesitating. 
And uh, I think I'll explain my hesitation, then I'll say a few things. I'm gonna hesitate because it's not my story to tell. The story about the university will all have our own views about what was worked well, didn't work well when Arvind was president, um, how we might feel about what happened at the Board of Governors, uh, depending on what we know about what was involved in the Board of Governors, what we might feel about um, all of the various issues that were raised as that came to an end. Um, but much of the story is really not mine. It's Arvind Gupta's. And I don't feel comfortable speaking on his behalf um, about what um, about what happened other than what he has said. Um, so that's just being respectful. I also signed all kinds of confidentiality agreements, but those things I figure at this point are no longer so relevant. It's mostly respect for, uh, for him as an individual. Um, I will say um, that I was disheartened that the university couldn't figure out a way to learn from the experience. Um, universities are places of learning. And um, I had a sense that the issues of governance around the Board of Governors and its relationship to the president, um, the issues um, that everything is pretty quickly swept under a carpet. We can't talk about it. It's quiet. Um, don't ask questions, but that's not supportive of um, a learning environment. And there has to be ways to talk about some things that might have been able to be done differently. They don't have to do with individuals. So I was um, disheartened by the way in which um, the university dealt with some of that, even as I also understand issues of confidentiality. And I've just said myself, my limits on speaking about it. Um, so that's probably not a very satisfactory answer. Well, I suspect Bob will think um, it was under the circumstances which you so eloquently stated. Um, can I, I, maybe this will be the last one, we'll see from Elizabeth Dean, by most metrics, I continue to experience a productive academic career. Academic life, however, was spiritually void, which I now work with to bridge. The Martha Piper's book, Nerve, reinforced this, along with reading more of Gabor Mate's work. Has any thought been given to establish a meetup group? Um, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that. I suppose you might be able to, Graham might be able to. I, I, um, it's a very interesting idea. I was just asked to do this and um, have appreciated the opportunity to speak with authenticity in a forum that, you know, university doesn't always offer that. Maybe someone else would be able to, um, or maybe you could say more about what you're thinking. Can we, can we bring Elizabeth in, um, Sandra? I don't know. Yeah, I'm working on it, yep. Well, meantime, Bob has uh, said, good answer to my question. I agree the important thing, oh gosh, it just went, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at technology. Good answer to my question. I agree the important thing is the opportunity uh, to learn from the experience. Uh, here's Elizabeth. Hi. Hi Thank Elizabeth. you so much, Anne. This has been a, a very interesting session. I just had hoped that, that we could even go further with your mm -hmm. transition, because I think mm -hmm. we all start to experience and, and ask many of these questions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Gabor Mate's work has been really re revolutionary to me. I'm in, in healthcare mm -hmm. and went to one of his sessions very early on in addiction, but soon realized as I got to, later on, many years later, started to think about some of the points that he was making regarding you know, early childhood experiences and so on, and how that has come to impact us um, mm -hmm. all, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that the notion of some sort of uh, meetup group would mm -hmm. be, I would really welcome that. And I didn't know if there'd be any other takers, 
or people interested in, in, in sort of exploring some of these issues and getting back in touch sort of with that, the, the spirituality of our being, not just uh, the academic and intellectual side. Any thoughts? I would be um, happy to um, explore that. Absolutely. So I, I have to say, I felt in this forum, um, a kind of mixture, right? And you can see in the kinds of uh, questions and what I was asked, a kind of mixture of different parts of myself. Um, but, and, and also different people will have tuned in for different aspects of what, what might've been my experience. Um, but were there interest from others? I'd be delighted to check in with each other and see if there's something that felt um, mm -hmm. useful and supportive, absolutely. It's the work Thank I you. do with people individually, so. Yes, um, well, I think I, I'd be happy to pay whatever fee. And <laughs> no, 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 I'm not a, saying that. I'm saying, fee. but that's exactly that exactly that spot. Not for everyone, but for many people, so. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, I was really, um, uh, really taken by the write-up and description of your transition mm -hmm. and being bold enough to have taken that retirement step early Mm -hmm. to kind of explore that part of you. I mean, mm -hmm. I said, I thought, good on you. I mean, it's very easy as I have to be lured uh, and continue to do wonderful things academically, but feeling the need more for the, you know, that, that more comprehensive holistic uh, part of our lives very much yeah. so. Yeah, I really, it's been at the heart. Well, of I can say, so, by the way, Elizabeth and, and Sandra said uh, that uh, something could be, uh, looked at in terms of setting up a special interest group and maybe uh, when alas we have to come to an end which is fairly soon mm -hmm. we could say something about that and um, Graham has also just I can just see others probably can too that he's open to setting up any particular group so obviously this would be a, a wonderful outcome. It yes, and I can just say one more thing. I often, when people ask me about academic life and, and you know, should they go down that track and so on, I often say, well, you know, academic life, there's no life like it, but there's no life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. So, <laughs> Over to you, Anne. <laughs> I don't think it has to be that way. Uh, well, um, exactly. But I think right. we've been, but I think we've been trained into it. We've trained ourselves into it. I, I'm not going to blame it on anything on the outside. No, no. We and I went down it, and I've it. had an amazing career. Right. I have to say, an amazing career. Mm -hmm. And serving on Senate for a couple of terms was part of that. And I, getting to meet other people in the university was fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, outside mm -hmm. the Faculty of Medicine was was a real treat. But uh, again, thank you both. I really appreciate it. It's a let... pleasure. Thank you for reaching out in that way. I, I find <laughs> that encouraging and um, life affirming for me. So thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. Are there any more questions? Because I don't want to close this off. I'm just going to check my chat, see if there are any more. No, I think we've, we've covered it. But uh, do do we've got just a couple of minutes left, alas. But if there is any other question, I suppose I should lead you back to, to uh, your discipline, if that's still the right word, um, of history. It seems to me one of what's fascinating about history is how, do you, how we deal with the problem of history. I mean, history has given us a whole lot of very unfortunate baggage. And it's gonna be interesting to see how particularly those of us interested in history, but it's all academics, how we move beyond that. I don't know whether you have anything to say about that. Okay, I'm gonna be honest and say I don't. Um, I don't, um, which doesn't mean that there's not something important to say about it. Um, I think I'd like to say something else, Rodri, Please. which is um, to express my appreciation for your questions and your flexibility and your ability to take on something that is probably quite a bit different than what you have usually done. And my appreciation to the people who have been a part of the conversation and listened and held in there for the same thing. Um, and for the opportunity to be, uh, to, sp to speak the, to the variety of ways in which um, my particular life has, uh, the, the, the variety of ways it's gone and the hopefulness, I think, that is there, not just for myself, but in general, 
for all of us as we follow our curiosities um, and our longings in every stage of our life. So I appreciate the opportunity to um, to be here. And well, for your I'm sure kind, for all of us here, we can just say questions. it's heartily reciprocated. It's been a, a wonderful time with you. Unfortunately, we probably should come to an end now, but maybe you and I could stay on the line with Sandra and possibly Graham about Elizabeth's idea. Um, no, I, I, you, I, I feel hugely privileged to be able to talk to all of you. I would like to put in a plug for the next conversation, which will be with Frank Chester on Tuesday, the 8th of February. But you know, um, I'm supposed to do the impossible, which is to sum up our conversation. You don't have to about, do that. Probably. No, I'm not even <laughs> going to try. So I, <laughs> I'm going to just uh, uh, go to a phrase you said, which was, uh, I think, a truly lovely phrase that you're in the business of keeping people company. Mm -hmm. So your company has been wonderful. Thank you. And thanks to everybody who's joined us. Bye now. Thank you.